Hi everyone, my name is Andrew Botella, uh, and I, uh, I'm with Igalia, and I will be talking about integrating task attribution and async context. This is a V8 M Blink feature. It's a bit of a change from the lightning talk that I gave on Tuesday, which was about layout and line clamp. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, here's a motivating example. Uh, Open Telemetry is an, uh, is an application monitoring tool. Uh, for performance and soft. And here uh, we have a tracer that we, uh, well, it's instantiated somehow. And uh, here we have a quick event uh, where we we start at an open telemetry span, which is a, a, well, a span of tasks that, that get tracked with performance and, well, and timing and soft. And then we do some async operations. Uh, in the middle, we call add event on the span, which is, uh, in, in this sense, it's just kind of a uh, console log within the span, uh, and it shows the it would show the timing uh, at, at which it happened. And then we, uh, after all of this, after fetching, processing stuff, we uh, call span dot end to mark as finished. The thing is, if we want to rest, uh, to uh, refactor this to have uh, uh, nested functions and like extract some uh, some code out and and that kind of stuff, you have to pass the span around. Uh, be, uh, that is the only way uh, you uh, like. If you need to call add event, for example, uh, there is no no other way of than to to pass it around. But if everything was synchronous, you could actually store the span in a global variable, uh, whether the, uh, it's actually global, uh, local to some module, whatever. Uh, and uh, you set the span uh, before starting any operation. Everything would just read the span uh, global. And uh, after that, you, uh, you always know that this will not run uh, this will only run with the uh, span that corresponds to to that uh, to that uh, call. This uh, this can only happen with synchronous code. There is no way to do it reliably if you use span from asynchronous code because the async task from the previous quick event might actually run after the next quick has happened. So here. Uh, well, if you imagine that this is uh, a, a wait fetch and wait process body, uh, the fetch could finish after uh, after you do the next click, and then span would have the the next uh, span value, and uh, uh, you would not be able to associate the information uh, the right way. So. Uh, this is a common thing. Uh, having to pass state around uh, async functions is a, is common. Uh, some uh, like some things are, uh, that that you need to do, for example, are uh, passing an abort signal around so that when you abort an, an async function, you're also aborting all of its dependencies. Uh, you could, um, if you're building maybe a logging extraction that wants to distinguish async flows of control. You have no way to do that other than having the uh, the user line code, uh, the user of that API, uh, pass that state around, and everything that basically would use no local variables if it wasn't because it's async. So all of these cases would actually be solved with something similar to thread local variables in languages like C++, except for async context, for async flows and or control and so on. And uh, you might think there are things that do that already, right? Uh, so there's Zone.js. Uh, the thing that it does is it monkey patches promise set timeout and other web and JavaScript APIs to track the async context of tasks. The thing with that is you can't monkey patch async await because it's syntax. And you might think that you might be able to, to work around that by monkey patching promises, but uh, uh, if you, you can do await 42, and it will do promise that result 42, but it will not use the global promise. Uh, it will use the uh, actual built-in. So you can monkey patch that. The only solution to that is to transpile, uh, to transpile anything uh, async await. 
uh, there is async local storage in Node.js and uh, together with its companion async resource. Uh, it does let you store values which are local to an async context. And th this is great, this is ex exactly what we want. But this is specific to Node.js and it's not available in the web. So that's what async context is meant to solve. This is a stage two to third name proposal. And uh, it makes something like Node.js and async local storage into a JavaScript language primitive. So here um, you see that we're creating an async context start variable and using it as the span. Uh, and here, rather, uh, rather than setting the span async variable, we call the async function inside a span async var, uh, dot run, which sets the span uh, on the, the function and anything that uh, spans from that, uh, that uh, anything that spawns from that, uh, whether it's uh, actual async continuations with with a wait or uh, even set timeout, as we'll see later. So that, uh, in in order to get that, you do uh, Spanish async var dot get, which gets the current value, the one associated to the current async flow of control. And then that is the span and you can call add event and whatever. So uh, as I mentioned, async context dot variable is a piece of storage, like the, the actual JavaScript object has a piece of storage that contains a single JavaScript value at any time, but it's preserved across async continuations. Uh, you have the run method, which uh, takes a value and a callback. It runs the callback immediately, uh, setting the value to 42 inside the, the context of that callback. You also have async context dot snapshot. This is a, this, uh, at construction time, it, this, takes a uh, snapshot of every value associated with every existing async context variable, like every value associated with every variable at the time that you, you're creating the, the context. So you can restore this context by calling run uh, uh, and, the, and a callback, and it again runs the callback within the snapshotted context. You can use this for building user land schedulers. So uh, here you have uh, user land schedule. You call defer function. This just uh, stores the callback that you pass to it with the current uh, snapshot. And then at some later point, you call call defer functions, and this uh, runs the callback within the snapshot that was uh, uh, set with it. Uh, and ideally, we would want all web and JavaScript APIs that spawn any tasks to work like that. So something like queue microtask, uh, set timeout request animation frame. Event listeners is an open question. We'll, uh, uh, we'll see about that later. Uh, they should store something that, we'll, that we're calling the registration time context, the snapshot at the point where you're uh, calling set timeout or, or whichever. And uh, that snapshot would be restored at call time. And here's an implementation of how this would be done in JavaScript. You just uh, implement set timeout by uh, Call, uh, creating uh, an async context or snapshot, and then you have some internal API that does the actual timeout, and inside you run the, the callback inside the snapshot. Uh, if this sounds familiar, uh, especially if you were attending BlinkCon uh, last year, whether virtually or in that building over there, uh, this is very similar to, uh, to what your vice was discussing in his task contribution talk. So. Let's talk about task attribution, right? There are a number of things in Chromium and in the web in general, actually, that require knowing when a task in the event loop was actually caused by some previous task. There's self-navigation matrix. We'll talk about those briefly later. There's long task attribution, uh, priority propagation in, uh, in scheduling. And the way that this works is that any scheduler web APIs, uh, set timeout and so on, they create a new task which is a descendant of the current one. Uh, so, uh, and like this is tracked by task contribution as a descendant, but async continuations uh, that is any await and any prompt for they then uh, continue the same task. This is tracked with uh, V8 set continuation preserved in better data API 
which basically just uh, you said the current task API uh, for any task, and that uh, got and gets uh, like V8 handles the async continuation by itself. So, as a bit of a recap, async context persists a set of value of key value mappings across async continuations and through Web APIs with scheduled tasks. Task attribution. Uh, tracks the provenance of tasks in the event loop by tracking async continuations, as well as uh, web APIs with scheduled tasks. They're the same picture. Uh, so they're, they could actually be layered one on top of each other. Uh, and if you ask me, it would be better to, last, uh, to layer task attribution on top of async context. Some people might disagree, but this is some JavaScript pseudocode for how you do that. Uh, you could still have uh, the in task attribution ID be an integer uh, ID, uh, but you ha would have an uh, link internal async context dot variable, which would store the current ID. Uh, when you call set timeout, uh, you again uh, take the current snapshot, but after the timeout, you create, a, uh, well, you restore the snapshot, and inside it get the current task ID, which at that point would be the parent task ID. Like uh, it's uh, you create a new task ID with that as the parent, and you run the uh, set timeout callback inside it, like with with that new uh, task ID. In most events, uh, task attribution actually needs uh, uh, any scheduling web APIs to restore the call time context rather than the registration time, which is something different from what you might uh, expect async context to want. So um, if you, uh, here's an example to uh, about tracking sub navigations from the start, like an initiating click on some element or uh, the user clicking back on, on, the, on the browser. Uh, you want to track that to any actual layout and update, uh, uh, like any layout and paint update. So you have to be able to associate the click event listener and the pop state event listener with the initiating click. And if those, uh, if the click event listener calls history dot push and push state, which uh, is what makes it a sub navigation, and then uh, they uh, wait a fetch. And then after fetching, you have the script updating the DOM. You cannot have the click and pop state event listener lose track of the initiating attribution. You must be able to, to preserve that. Uh, so each of those, uh, those event listeners must be a descendant of the initiating click, not of the task where the event was registered, not of the task where you called add event listener or set on click. So uh, you could say that the uh, events are used in two different ways. Uh, there are one-off handlers, which uh, the kind of thing that you in, that in JavaScript you wrap in a promise and a wait. Something like a click event in a confirmation dialog that will be dismissed after the click. Like you're showing the confirmation dialog, you're immediately adding the event listener, and uh, af uh, after you actually click it, it will be gone. So it, there's no chance for it to be clicked twice. Uh, well, it could be uh, click try mm, twice, but well, if it, it, it takes too long to run the the actual uh, the actual task, but uh, you get what I what I mean, right? Uh, here's a message event for a window or uh, well, no for worker uh, that's waiting for a worker's response to some specific request. Uh, so uh, there are uh, state events for XML HTTP request and file reader that they're also very much one-offs. Uh, and the rest of events are repeat handlers. You just have a click event on an, on an element that, is, that will be present throughout the page's lifetime that could be clicked multiple times. You're not uh, using it as a continuation for uh, some JavaScript task. So, uh, given this dichotomy, uh, how you uh, like, oh, yep. Yeah. Notice that here we're uh, click can be a one of handler and a repeat event. And it's not necessarily feasible, I, I don't think, for the browser to be able to tell the difference. 
like you could maybe use your heuristics. But so uh, this all brings us to the question of how events would work with async context, how they should work, which uh, context they should propagate. Um, what we're thinking currently is to make them registration time by default, uh, which in like having them work the same as set timeout. Uh, this is not what is currently the case in task attribution. Uh, we'll see more, some more of that in the next slide. And But there would be specific events or specific event dispatchers, not necessarily specific event names, that would be a special, ca uh, special case to be call time rather than uh, registration time. And how this would work in the specs would be that uh, you would have callback functions and interfaces, which are the web ideal representation of function objects in JavaScript. Uh, when, you're, uh, uh, when you're passing a callback to something that, uh, that takes a callback function or interface, that would store the registration time context as part of the web ideal type. But uh, invoking it, uh, when invoking it, you would be able to uh, to switch whether uh, you would use that registration time uh, snapshot or whether not to switch into anything and use the call time. And that would work the same way for event dispatching. So uh, in task attribution, like this is what is currently the case in task attribution that I actually dug through the Chrome code uh, two days ago or like yesterday for some of these things uh, to to track this. The things that are registration time are currently queue microtask, set timeout, request animation frame, request idle callback, schedule post task, the things that you would expect. Uh, currently, all events and all observers, like mutation observer, uh, intersection observer, all of that is call time. And uh, there are some specific cases which are uh, not which don't use the call time that you would expect. Um, uh, for pop save, uh, the call time descends from the move through history if that happens via script, which is the case that, that we were showing here. Uh, like that's that was specific. Uh, that is special case to allow that use case. And for message, which are uh, which is when you call uh, post message on a window or uh, a worker uh, a message for. If that happens in, uh, uh, like if the message comes from the same isolate, then the call time uh, descends from the context at the time of the call to post message. Uh, this is supposed to, like this is, and this works uh, that way, uh, as I was uh, discussing with, uh, with Scott uh, the other day. Uh, this is because many uh, user line JavaScript libraries use post message as a way to schedule things. Uh, as a uh, when there were no, there was no scheduler dot post task and and those things like that. So um, there are a number of open questions, uh, which we uh, I was hoping to discuss and maybe try to figure out in the time that that remains. Should task attribution and async context be implemented together, even? Like, currently, my implementation in, in V8 for async context is, uh, works completely separate from uh, set continuation and better uh, set. That thing that we saw before uh, that task attribution is currently using. And uh, like it could be the case that both uh, work separately, and uh, it could be that they're not implemented together. That seems like. Uh, duplicating work, or, uh, especially for maintaining, but okay. Uh, or maybe task attribution uh, should be the basis on which async context would be implemented, uh, if, but that would be implementing a JavaScript feature in, in Blink rather than in V8. Um, that doesn't make sense for events to be registration time by default. Uh, maybe it does. Uh, like I was convinced that, that, it, would, that it should uh, not even a month ago. I'm, I'm not so sure about that anymore. So uh, which event should be call time? Is it just this uh, two that we saw here? Because if uh, if that attribution needs and uh, finds another use case that you would want to implement, and you also have async context, which makes this very much observable, uh, that would not be able to be changed 
after the fact. Like that would become a web reality. Uh, it's in context that snapshot could be an issue for task attribution, especially when you're talking about things like uh, uh, changing the priority or uh, to which things uh, the priority on which things in third party scripts which are uh, known or suspected to be a malicious uh, run. If you if that script has access to a async context snapshot, which comes from a non malicious script, that would be an issue. Uh, and that is like it's not like that's not currently possible to do, but it would be, it be would become uh, very much an API that would directly let you do that rather than uh, having to hook up uh, async continuations and so on. And uh, one other thing is uh, there's something in the HTML uh, spec that tracks incumbent realms in order to figure out which uh, in which window some things should run when you have. Uh, multiple iframes and things go, uh, calling into iframes and, and back and, and uh, complicated stuff like that. Apparently, that could be able to be modeled as an instant context variable. I don't understand the details, but uh, maybe it could save on spec complexity in, in that sense. Uh, I have a couple, uh, uh, implement, well, I have work in progress implementations. Uh, with a CL uh, uh, in V8 for async context. The design doc is in progress and has been for months, but uh, working on it. And uh, there's a Blink CL for the integration in task attribution. And we have uh, specs on the, uh, on the like spec pull requests on the web spec side in progress. Uh, the task attribution CL is constantly in, uh, in a state of merge conflict because in order to to be able to pull a V8CL, I have to change the depths, and that breaks every time that the depth, that V8 updates, uh, like every time that V8 gets upgraded. I'm not sure if anyone knows a way to fix that, but yeah, just so you know that it's in a constant state of merge conflict. And uh, yeah, that that's it. I guess there's not much time for questions and so, uh, and so on, but if you... Yeah, I was hoping to have to have a more of an open floor, but sure. All right, we got several from the floor. Okay, so uh, I got a comment and I got a, a questions. Uh, we've done a bit of. Uh, Instrumentation in dev tools to be able to attribute uh, asynchronous tasks. And uh, this is by no means complete. And it's not critical in case of dev tools, I guess, because this is, uh, after all, only affects uh, what uh, uh, what we show in uh, timeline and async stacks. But uh, I presume it's going to be a bit more critical. You are implementing it as a uh, platform facing API. And like, do you have uh, an idea from your prototype implementation uh, of uh, how easy it would be to provide reasonable uh, coverage for different, uh, for a lot of places where I think uh, tasks occur? Yeah, the, uh, we've considered the, the fact that uh, this would have to be very well integrated with, with dev tools in order to uh, give uh, authors the tools that they need to in order to debug all of this. I'm not sure what all. Of, uh, I'm not sure about all that would be needed in, uh, in order to to allow that. Uh, someone with more experience on on dev tools might be able to to have some more context. And another question: You seem to be trying to solve a very particular case of uh, providing uh, attribution for uh, performance. Um, uh, measurements with a rather generic API that exposes yet another way to pass global state. And the question is uh, whether we are, like, by doing it in a so generic way, whether we're exposing, uh, like, additional means uh, for developers to shoot themselves in the foot by, just by uh, sharing global state with a fairly uh, convoluted semantics of how it gets shared. Uh well, uh, so uh, in, uh, what you, uh, like uh, open telemetry is one of the use cases. It's 
in some sense, it's the the I guess one of the use cases that motivated this uh, uh, this uh, this their name uh, proposal. But uh, there are many others. Uh, we saw uh, over uh, where is it uh, over here that there are uh, some like having to pass state around uh, with async functions seems to be to some extent a common problem. Like uh, I, uh, I think the abort signal uh, case is very powerful. I think so. Uh, it's not only about uh, about performance. Uh, would it be a, a way for users to to shoot themselves in uh, themselves in the foot? Uh, uh, I guess everything can be, but uh, it's a, it's important to note that you only have uh, like this is not. So different from the way it was in the in the synchronous case with a uh, with a global variable. Uh, the only global thing, like you can only access the state, the the storage that is associated to an async context variable if you have the variable. So uh, it would not be any different from that. We, even with an async context of snapshot you would not be able to iterate through every uh, async context variable that is stored in the snapshot. You would only be able to access them if you have them. Uh, so I don't think it's a, it's a food gun in that sense. Um, thank you. Uh, I, had a, I, I have to admit, I'm a little confused about, I guess, what the objective of the async context proposal is. I went and looked at it, and I, I see maybe two things that could be, and one was to make it easier to debug. For example, if there is a captured variable that you would not normally be able to see because of the way that closures work or the scope capture works, then you'd be able to continue to see that later. The second was to maybe create some kind of a spiritual equivalent to thread local storage. Is that right? To some extent, uh, well, uh so the, these problems are the same that uh, problems that uh, you would have with uh, that the local storage would solve, and in in some sense, uh, like I, I guess that uh, yeah, like so I, uh, for uh, for a lot of those things, uh, you would have to uh, pass uh, state around. Uh, especially if, uh, for some of those things, even through uh, through functions that you don't actually control, uh, when you pro uh, one of the examples that I might have like that I actually changed to not having the slides was a server side platform providing uh, like calling into your code to to handle some some requests you provide uh, like you return a response and. They would uh, they would uh, monkey patch console.log to have some information in uh, about that request. There, uh, the platform would not have access to the uh, to the developer code that is actually handling the request. Uh, the uh, the developer would be forced to pass state around, uh, and it, that gets worse when you're talking about. Uh, Third-party APIs that you don't even uh, control their API. Thanks, uh, Alex Russell, also from the Edge team. Um, have you gotten feedback on? Can you go back to the slide that you were on that showed uh, the last code example that you had brought up that had the uh, this one? Yeah. Um, th there's quite a lot of this, which is um, boilerplate to get and access the. Uh, the variable that's being uh, closed over here. Uh, um, the only uh, actual boilerplate is spanning sync dot get. The yeah, add yeah. event is part of the span. And, get and, to end, and then to uh, construct it in the first place. All mm -hmm. those are quite wordy. Um, is the plan here to follow up with some syntax? And and sort of as a follow-on to that, have you talked to the tag about the integration with the DOM APIs? Because I feel like this is a follow-on to some of the work that was done to integrate promises widely through the DOM, and, and their support might help you get further down the path. Uh, the this, this semantic that you're presenting here is, is uh, wonderful, by the way, and uh, long overdue. So thank you for doing the work. 
we're not currently considering uh, syntax uh, in order to do this. Um, about uh, we haven't yet consulted the tag for dumb integration. But one thing that was raised when we were discussing this with some uh, implementers is uh, this about uh, able, this about signal uh, use case to to have that be actually uh, work uh, intern like to have that uh, work internally so that uh, you would somehow uh, do an equivalent of uh, async context variable run uh, with a board signal dot run and anything that runs on under that would which would take a signal uh, so that well you don't have to actually specify it uh, with it so that that is something that we were starting to consider uh, to have that work together um, it's still very early to to say I guess uh, we will be consulting the tab for for that dumb stuff. Yeah. All right, thank you very much, Andrew. Everyone give a hand.